Welcome to Sam's Book Club. I am Sam and here we go. Today we are reviewing Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek, one of the most important books you could ever read in terms of leadership. It sets the tone for a different kind of leadership. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so if you are either a panelist and you're here or you are an attendee and you're listening to this or you're watching it later on YouTube, I'm ask you that you bow your heads. Let's have a word of prayer before we dive right deep into this book. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the ultimate leader, and we pray that you guide uh, this summary, this discussion about this book. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This book club started as a response to the growing teams of digital missionaries from around the world. We have at the moment, um, over 120 people working in the Philippines, in Australia, in India, in Brazil, in Africa, different countries, uh, in North America, in Central America, basically every continent. And expansion in leadership um, in, in teams requires a great deal of alignment. And most importantly, it requires leadership. One of the things that really struck me about this book, even from the first time that I read it, uh, this is now the third time that, I'm, that I've read through it for this, the purposes of this meeting, is that you should manage resources and lead people. And many of us have been experiencing or have experienced in the past leaders who try to manage us. And something that the book brings out, which I thought was fascinating, is no one wakes up one day and says, I'm really excited about going to the office. Why? Because I'm going to be managed. Uh, no one is excited about being managed. People are excited about being led. And leadership is not something that is easy to come by. Leadership is not something that has a that that is that is easy to find great leaders. Uh, but is it because they are born like that and they just don't have the gene of leadership, or because they haven't been taught how to lead? And and those are questions that people have been going around and around and around for a long time. But the book starts with a, a fantastic beginning uh, where it says, great leaders will sooner sacrifice their things um, for the benefit of their people rather than sacrifice their people for the benefit of their thin, things. So I, there are many different elements of, of understanding leadership in the context of work. But the most important one is take care of your people. Your people really, really matter. So if you are in whatever team that you find yourself in, it is easy to think that people are just replaceable. They are like commodities. You know, you've got one thing, one person doing this for you today, and they're a dime a dozen. Next week, you can get more. And if they, you don't like them, you can just go and move to someone else. That is not the best way to approach uh, anything really, but especially leadership. So if you're leading one of our teams, understand that the people that you've been assigned to or the people that you invited are your most trusted, most important um, asset, if you can call it that. And don't think that they are replaceable. Do what you absolutely can do so that they can thrive. And there are many things that are that are important in helping people to thrive. Now, let's talk about the four chemicals uh, or, th or the five chemicals, if you include cortisol. So this is a, it's an incredible thing. It was one of the most fascinating things I read, even for the first time that I read the book. I co-wrote a book a couple of years ago with a neuroscientist for teenagers. And it, I, I've been absolutely fascinated by the biological developments that we have when it comes to leadership, especially. So the first, um, the first chemical, the first hormone, if you will, that was, was talked about is um, endorphins. And I would like to start with a different one. I would like to start with dopamine instead of endorphins because dopamine is the, is the hormone that sets the goal. You have a goal and then you run for that goal. You determine that this is where I'm going to go and then you go for it. And that's dopamine. Dopamine is, is that hormone of, of, that defines where you want to go. Somewhere else, uh, not, not in this book, but somewhere else I read uh, studies on dopamine, especially with rats. And if you take away the dopamine receptors in the brain, uh, rats just wake up and they don't have the desire to eat. 
They don't have the desire to, to, to mate. They don't have the desire to drink. They don't have the desire to do absolutely anything. If you put a little bit of water in, in, a, in a rat's mouth, the rat drinks the water. So the rat is thirsty, but he has no motivation. Absolutely zero motivation um, at all. So it's very important that we, that we define how we are going to see our motivations every day. And dopamine plays a really important part. So when you wake up and you think, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have breakfast, dopamine. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to read a book, dopamine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer my emails, dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Very important to, to handle dopamine properly. What happens when dopamine goes wrong? Well, it's, we do this all the time. When you have very dopamine-rich activities, such as social media, such as games that you play, such as videos that you watch, these very pleasurable activities that you pursue. Um, and of course, you could add to this uh, any other addiction. It's, it's dopamine that gets you addicted. I'll give you the example. Um, morphine is medical grade heroin. That's what it is. And when grandma went to have her surgery, she was on morphine for a while. And you don't find grandmothers coming out of the hospital, you know, waiting for the next fix and trying to find a dealer to sell them, um, to sell them uh, heroin. It just doesn't happen. Why? Because heroin is less addictive from a chemical perspective than it is from a behavioral perspective. When you have the dopamine is what really addicts people. And it's the go-to um, chemical for any, any addiction or any motivation for that matter, as I said before. So when you shortcut your system by absolutely flooding it with lots of dopamine, uh, what happens is your sensors, they become less sensitive to dopamine. So if you spend the day playing video games, what happens is that you are incapable of doing anything difficult in your life because any motivation to read a book, any motivation to, to you know, follow anything that's difficult and worthwhile doing, well, you're not going to have the motivation to do it. So dopamine is, is incredibly important for that. And what's the solution? The solution is really simple. Take a Sabbath. That's what it is. During the Sabbath, your body will simply reset those receptors for dopamine. But, but what, what do I do? The point is you don't do. The point is that you go through this period of this really important thing called boredom. Boredom is incredibly important for your health. And we are allergic to boredom. Just ask any teenager. I mean, you can't have a moment of doing nothing. Um, that's very important. Being bored means that you reset those receptors and then you can start doing things that are difficult. The other trick for dopamine is to always start your day with difficult things. Things that are hard to do, um, start with that. Things that you're not motivated to do, start with that. Today, I met with my PhD advisor after a very long time. And I had very little to show for, for the last few months. I've been otherwise engaged with a few projects that many of you here are involved with as well. And as I started the day, I thought I need to catch up on this. So I, I practically tried not to touch my phone or anything else that would give me dopamine. And I started with the difficult things of reading and preparing a literature review uh, analysis for that meeting. Uh, because I knew that if I'd done anything before that, I would not be able to do this difficult thing afterwards. So measure your dopamine levels. Then we come to endorphins. Endorphins are the great things that individually uh, that numb your pain and get you through the difficult moments in life. It is a dope. Uh, it's it's a painkiller, a a painkiller for your body. You produce your own painkiller. It's endorphins, and endorphins is when your brain interprets that it's a worthwhile pain that you're going through, and and this interpretation is really interesting because some people are able to do this better than others. Some people can tell themselves, this is worthwhile. I'm going to push through this. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to get through this. That's your body producing endorphins that help you get through the pain of achieving something that is worthwhile achieving. Now we come to the two very interesting ones. And we start with serotonin. 
serotonin. It's a beautiful hormone. Serotonin comes when you feel respected and when you feel that you have increased your status in any hierarchy. That's exactly what happens when you, you, you work with a team that respects you. Now, unfortunately, most teams don't produce a lot of serotonin. Most teams are dysfunctional because instead of honoring each other's efforts, people spend time trying to find fault in someone else's work. And when that happens, all of the safety disappears. Simon Sinek talks about the circle of safety in one of the companies he talks about. Um, serotonin and cortisol are the two hormones that um, the two chemicals that counterbalance each other. So when you feel safe and when you feel honored, and when you feel respected, what happens? You produce serotonin. And your body interprets that as, as you're being honored, that you are being um, respected, and that your status, your status, status depending on, on how you pronounce that word, it, it grows. So let me give you an example of this right now. Let me take, uh, let me take somebody here from the list. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll look between our panelists. Let's have a look between our panelists here. Here they are. Okay, I'm going to take uh, Justin. Justin, do you have any video? Maybe not. Me? Yes, do you have any video with you? If you don't mind seeing me in my t-shirt. I don't mind seeing you in your t-shirt. It's fine. We can handle it. Can we handle it, guys? I think we can handle it. So let me spotlight uh, the video on you. And Justin, we did not plan this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Justin, you are one of the most brilliant people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. The way that you look at designing of systems, it's, it's the most beautiful thing. You think of them in terms of the user. You think of them in terms of that are, that are structured. And when you put yourself in a project, your passion for God and for seeing the mission being achieved is it's just a wonder to be around you when you are in that element in trying to deliver absolutely great things. You know that what I'm saying is true because we've shared those thoughts and those dreams before. It's not new to you. Yet in the context of the whole team listening to my opinion about you and your work, your body has produced a ton of serotonin. And it's unforgettable. From this moment on, you will, you will remember this moment because it's a very special moment. Somebody honored and respected you. And you feel a little bit like in the great status of the community that we find ourselves in, that your level of respect has increased. And therefore, you feel the sense of serotonin. And it's beautiful because that means you are going to make your team much happier. Leaders that have serotonin in them, they are healthier and happier. And I'll tell you why. It's a very interesting reason. And to understand why, we're going to Africa. And this is not in the book. This is an analysis of, of my, my thinking since the first time I read the book. If you just want to know what the book says, then read the book. Um, but this is going further into the areas of the book. Have you ever wondered why a lion, the alpha lion, just lies down and waits for the lionesses to go into the wilderness, to go into the danger and hunt. And it's dangerous to hunt. He just waits. The lionesses hunt, they bring the, the game, they bring the food, they, they put it at his feet. Nobody touches it, no cub dares, they just wait. And then the lion stands and the lion goes toward the, the, the food and they get the first share of the food. They can pick whatever quality of food they want, uh, four, and, four and a half kilos of food, and they eat it. After they are done, then comes the cubs, and then comes the lionesses. Now, for a book that is written on leaders eat last, you would think that this lion is a terrible leader. Why do the lionesses, together they are much stronger than this lion, why do they step back and allow this to happen. Oh, it's nature, that's why. Um, here is the truth of why that happens. This lion enjoys the best food, enjoys the best rest, enjoys the best of that the group has to offer for a very simple reason. When you are full of serotonin, and by the way, 
the same hormones run in animals as they do in, in humans. It's, it's a fascinating thing. And when the lion experiences this, a lot of serotonin, your body reacts in a very specific way. Your mood is regulated. So your mood is reg. Think about it. Your mood is regulated. You don't explode for no reason, and you don't become depressed for for very little that happened. Your mood is regulated. What happens is you are you are able to think more creatively. You are able to lead in a much better way, and you are able to measure whether a fight is worth it or not. So here is the point of this lion, and here is the point to all leaders. The reason why people honor their leaders is that when danger comes to the tribe, when danger comes to the group, who do you think needs to step out and become the shield between the danger and the group? Who needs to put their life at risk to protect the group? It's the alpha. It's the leader. The leader is honored so that they have enough serotonin not to jump into a fight prematurely so that they can position themselves as strong. And I, I was in a, in a wild park last year at those wonderful days when we still traveled. And I noticed that lions in the park that walked by themselves, um, they were thin, they, were, they, were, they did not eat properly, uh, they were malnourished. And when one of those lions tries to take a, 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 a pride to himself, he needs to measure the alpha and how strong the alpha is. And the alpha needs to position himself as, look, I am going to give my life before you take this pride. Because when another lion comes, by the way, if you're not familiar with, with animal, with this dynamics, the new alpha, if he wins, he will first of all um, kill every cub in that pride. So there is a protective nature of this. And here's the point to us leaders. People will honor you, but they will honor you because you decided to put yourself on the line to protect your team. If people don't know at a moment's notice that you would put your reputation on the line to protect theirs, they will not surrender to your leadership. It is as simple as that. They need to know that come what may from the top, you will be their shield to protect them from the, from the onslaught if it comes to your team. A leader is the one who absorbs the mistakes of their team. And I learned this in my first six months of the general conference. And what happened was we, when I arrived, I had to prepare my first project was the branding of the, of the Adventist church. So um, my boss, Williams, Elder Williams, he said, look, Focus on this. He, give, he gave me nothing else to do. So focus on this um, and find out what it would take to really do an amazing rebranding of the Adventist church. And that's when I started. We bought 19 books, gave it out to the team, and we started reading and devouring everything about branding. I, I had the privilege of traveling to talk to some of the largest branding uh, companies in the world. And it was a phenomenal exercise. I came back and I was very happy. Because the project, the rebranding of the Adventist church that should cost about $10 million, I came back with a proposal to do it for one and a half million, only one and a half million dollars. It was the most beautiful thing. And I presented this to Williams before going to administration. And he just looked at me and said, maybe you could have run this by me beforehand. I said, well, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And he said, okay, let's present it. It was a disaster. I had you know, the president of, of the general conference and all the vice presidents and the treasurer were there in the room. Absolutely unforgettable experience for me. I remember Juan Prestol, the treasurer slept within eight minutes. He, he zoned out. He said, this, this is not going to go anywhere. It was my first presentation to administration. And, and it was so far from our culture. Uh, now looking back, I understand it exactly what happened. By the end of it, we had not done the due diligence that we needed. And we had not estimated that the maximum amount we would get, and this is what we got, uh, was under $100,000. We had $80,000 to play with, which is impossible to rebrand a movement of, of this magnitude with 162,000 congregations with $80,000. That's what we thought. And in the end, I remember the onslaught of comments. It was awful. I presented, I sat down, and it was, but 
where do we propose we find this budget? And this is not this is not what we do. Explain again what these companies will do. They will design things for us. Well, we have designers. Why is it going to cost so much? And the company that had the best proposal is the same company that manages Shell, a twenty billion dollar company. They manage all of Ford and Rolls Royce and major brands in the world. So th their price was much lower because they wanted to work with a religious organization, just to learn from us. That's what we discovered, and it was great. But here's the thing. It was very far-fetched. The lesson was, I didn't have to speak anymore. Williams, my boss here in, in our organization, took the entire thing on his shoulders. Said, no, I'm fully behind this and, um, and it's important. And we are gonna do whatever we can. And I, I heard nothing. And I don't think I shared this publicly, but he took the entire thing. It was as if I was absolutely blameless in the whole process. From that moment on, obviously, it is easy to work with a leader like this. The easiest thing in the world for him would be to just say, yep, Sam, you shouldn't have done this. Where he positions himself with administration and says, yeah, this, this was a plan that was too, it was too broad. And you shouldn't have done this and you shouldn't have done that. Instead, he positioned himself on my side and protected me from whatever happened that day. That kind of leadership I've seen from him time and time again. And that's what we need to all try and emulate. The idea of protecting the people that are under us. Because if people feel safe, here's the punchline. If people feel safe, they will produce the best work of their lives. How can we help people feel safe? That's the key question to us leaders. So if you're leading a team in the Philippines and you've got seven people under you, the question is, how do you make them feel safe? How do you help them feel that they can produce their best? And if something goes wrong, that you will take the blame for it. Uh, that's, that's an important question there. So then we come to the opposite of serotonin, which is cortisol. When you don't feel safe, Cortisol is produced. And cortisol does the opposite of serotonin. And we talked about lions. If you saw in the corner of your eye a lion come into to my, to my basement here, what would happen is that my body would flood with cortisol. And cortisol would stop the function of my liver. It would stop the function of my kidneys. It would stop every bodily function except my muscles and my strength and my determination uh, to survive. Uh, it's the fight or flight. Bring it on. Cortisol would stop my critical thinking. My, the frontal lobe of my brain would practically stop working because I don't want to philosophize when I see a lion. I don't want to stop to think about the meaning of life when I see a lion. So my frontal lobe, my moral decisions, whatever else comes, is gone. Why? Because I need to survive. God built it this way. We were created this way so that we would respond when in situations of danger. Your brain neurotransmitters will fire at three times the speed. So if you had an experience near death, you would remember that your life flashed in front of your eyes. And it seemed like 12 minutes went by when it really was 30 seconds that the car was flipping over. Many people tell that experience. Why? Because your brain is working at overcapacity. It is firing at a, an incredible speed so that you can process those things and survive if you can. Now, what happens when we are in an environment that we don't feel safe in, that we're constantly having to defend ourselves in? What happens is that cortisol is released daily and we, our health begins to suffer because all of our body functions are no longer the same. You're flooded in cortisol. Your moral decisioning suffers. Remember, serotonin regulates your mood. What happens when there is no serotonin, just cortisol? You explode. And again, the reason why we honor and respect our leaders is that we don't want them to have cortisol. Trust me, you don't want a boss that is flooded in cortisol. You want a boss that has serotonin flooding out of him or her. Why? Can you imagine going to a boss in a factory and saying, hey, boss, machine two just stopped. Can you imagine if the boss exploded in front of you? I knew this would happen and absolutely lost his mind. Is that the kind of boss you want? Or perhaps a, a depressive boss. You go to him and say, hey, boss, machine number two just stopped. And then they start crying in front of you. I knew it. I just knew it. We're not going to make it. We're all going to be fired. We, we, you don't want a boss like that either. 
So how do you have a boss that, reg that, that has serotonin regulating their mood and then can act properly and appropriately in every situation? You respect them. But in order for you to have that, you need to be respected too. And the thing about serotonin is that when you are watching something happen, you produce it. So when Justin, when I was talking to you, other people in this team, other people that are listening, they felt a little bit less, but they also felt serotonin as I was talking to you. So if you create an environment where that happens constantly, what you have by the end of the day is that your entire team is so full of serotonin, you're all ready to give your best and things just flow in an entirely different way. What happens if your team is scared? You just have cortisol. People blaming other people and this, and then that's it. It's, the, it's, the, it's, it's a dysfunctional team and we cannot have this functional team. Our mission as a church is too important for our teams to be dysfunctional. We're dealing with life and death situations of people that, that, that will either make it eternally or not. It really, really matters. And it matters because of the fourth or the fifth substance, the fourth positive substance, which is oxytocin. Oxytocin is magical. Oxytocin is what happens when we connect with another human being. When you feel absolutely connected with another human being, oxytocin takes away your pain if you're experiencing pain. Oxytocin uh, creates purpose in your life. Oxypo oxytocin is, is, it brings you a level of joy that is incredible. It's indescribable. So when you have, and I learned this, the power of oxytocin, when my son was born, the first son, uh, we, the, the labor took a long time. And the pain was, was insane, obviously. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, why women go through this. It is, it is insane to me. Um, and if you've witnessed the pain of giving birth, you would, you would, you would know how crazy this is. And there are, there are two labors. You know, you have the birth of the baby and then you have the birth of the placenta in a natural birth. And the, it, the, the pain should continue. There's nothing that stops the pain between the baby and the placenta, except that now the mother has a baby in her arms. And in England, the baby is placed, you know, skin to skin on the mother. And the baby looks at the mother and the mother looks at the baby. And when Amy looked at James and James looked at Amy, I could sense it. I couldn't feel it because, it, you know, it wasn't me experiencing it, it was her. But I could sense two things were happening. The first, the pain was practically gone. The second, now this is crazy. The memory of the pain was practically gone. But, but not for me, just for her. So, you know, a year later, a year and a half later, she turns to me and says, shall we do this again? I go, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? Who would put themselves in this situation again? Oxytocin. That's the power of oxytocin. It kills the pain and it kills the, 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 the very memory of the pain. So those four things tell me that our creator, God built within us the the. How can I put this? The, the compass for joy and purpose. I was talking to a friend this week. He works at a major bank corporation. He's a high-flying developer there. And I was talking to him and he was describing, we, we, he gave me three hours of his Sunday to discuss software for mission. And I can't afford three hours of his time, right? In any rate. And he, he gave it. Here's, let's talk. Let's, let's dream. And later, he called me to say that during the week, his life is, a, is just unnecessary stress. And he's dealing with these very complex situations. And it's just stress and stress and stress. And he felt that on Sunday, giving three hours of his time to continue doing the same thing he does during the week, but he felt such a sense of purpose. He left our meeting. He described it as singing in the corridors and in the elevator as, as he went down his building. He said that suddenly he had an influx of this feeling of joy and his life mattered and it was worth something. Why? Because God built these hormones to come in our lives at those moments where we feel that what we're doing matters and this is the direction we should go. And if, if you are not experiencing this, as you work on this digital evangelism initiative, then call me because we need to talk. You're not understanding it. 
Because if you understood it, you would know how amazing this thing is at this moment in life's history, at, at, at this time. And you are playing a very important time, a very important uh, role. Each person is playing a very important role in this uh, process. So that's the chemicals that we touched on. Uh, we talked about the circles of safety. Um, and we talked about... Okay, so let's talk about the army. And then we'll open for questions. Uh, my father was in the military. He was a, a, a coronel, which is the highest rank in the military police that you can achieve. And he commanded 10,000 men. And at the time, they were practically only men. And he always told the story of Alexander the Great, who did something that no one else imagined. He conquered the world in three and a half years. He was a student of Aristotle, who in turn studied with Plato. And that's, that was basically my upbringing, uh, Greek philosophy and uh, military uh, techniques. So he would teach me the techniques that Alexander used in his troops and the, the techniques of Napoleon and, and every other major general. But anyway, he always mentioned uh, Alexander the Great, how they were crossing the desert from India and um, trying to make it to Babylon, trying to make it to the city again. And they were thirsty. Men were dying of thirst. It was awful. And one soldier found some water. And the soldier brought the water to Alexander in a helmet and, and took it to him, big bowl of water to him. And he took the water in his hand and he said, this is not, it's too much for one person and not enough for everyone. And he tipped it in the sand to the despair and the amazement of his soldiers. That's the kind of man that Alexander was. The kind of general that prefers not to drink until all of his soldiers can drink. And when we find a leader like this, we are with them for life. And we give them our lives. We give them what we have absolute best. And here is the greatest point of this book, which the book did not go into. That's what Jesus did. The reason why we worship Jesus and, and he is the king of kings and Lord of lords is simply because he was willing to pay the biggest price. That's the point. The point is that he was willing to give to all of us what we couldn't even give to ourselves. He sacrificed everything for the sake of people. He did not sacrifice people for the sake of other things. And that's whenever we find a ruler like this, a ruler that is willing to sacrifice their own majesty, if you will, for the sake of people, to save people, we immediately want them to rule over us. That's, that's a, an incredible thing because, in, and, and we, we see this everywhere, especially in the Adventist church. I learned that in the Adventist church, if you want to increase the influence of your ministry, there are only two things that really matter. The first thing is competence. You have to be very good at what you do. Whatever it is that you do, hone your craft, study it, get better at it, read the maximum amount of books you can read, watch the right YouTube videos, learn, try, be diligent, get better at it. Competence is, is so important. Oh, but there are politics. There are politics in every organization. Nothing beats competence long-term, nothing. Competence is the first. The second one is very important, is humility. Um, Juan Prestol says competence and character, and I agree. Humility is part of that character. If we put you in a higher position, are you going to use your power to humiliate others or to serve others? That's the one question that we have whenever we ask somebody to serve in the Adventist church. It's, it's as simple as those two things. Are you competent to do a job and to learn quickly? And the second thing, if we ask you to lead others, are you going to be humble enough to serve them or are you going to lord over them and use your newfound title? And I love the story that, um, that Simon Sinek tells about the former, I think he's the secretary of state or, or something like that, I, where he comes to the stage and he's holding a cheap cup of, of uh, I think it's coffee, a cheap cup of coffee. 
And he laughs and says, last year, I was the secretary. Uh, and so when I arrived in the airport, there was some, I flew business class. There was somebody at the airport to pick me up. They took me to my hotel. There was, they heard already checked me in the next day. There was somebody to pick me up. They took me backstage to the green room. They gave me a, a ceramic mug with my coffee, but this time I'm the former secretary, which means that there was nobody waiting for me at the airport. I flew coach. When I arrived, there was nobody there. When I got to the hotel, I had to check myself in. I had to get a taxi to this venue. And when I asked for a drink, they just pointed to the uh, cheap cups, the xylophone cups, and I had to get my own coffee. And here's the lesson. The, all the service last year wasn't for me. It was for the position I hold. What I deserve is a xylophone cup. Everything else was the position I hold. And if you, if you work in the general conference, it's sometimes difficult to handle that as you travel to different parts of the world and you are truly honored by the people that are there. It's a, it's a flooding of serotonin. And you need to remember that this is not for you. It's for the position you hold. And the next person who will occupy that position, I pray we give them the same level of honor and the same level of serotonin so that they can lead us better. That's, that's that part. Okay, I said that was the final, but there's one more thing. We are dealing in, in digital evangelism with very large numbers. We're reaching thousands of people, millions of people. In the recent AWR campaign, we reached 35 point something million people around the world were reached. Saw Adventist content in front of their eyes. And that's a beautiful thing, but it's, it means very little. Why? Because it's just a number. What really matters and what you and I need to connect with is the humanization, not the dehumanization, but the humanization of each number. Each person who asked for prayer was struggling for something, and that's why they asked for prayer. We do what we do for each individual person. Jesus died for each individual person, included the wretched you and me. And when we do digital evangelism, the statistics they only matter if we can see the real people behind them. So it's important for you to keep a constant connection with real people. Don't just look at numbers. You need to look at the very people that you're impacting. And Karen, I thank you so much because you capture those stories and you tell us those stories of what's happening. And that's really important because sometimes... Let's say you do SEO research. I mean, all you do is look at how many people are searching for this and that. All you do is numbers. You need to know that somebody, because you chose the right words, somebody searched for it and found this video, and now they know about Jesus. And now they can have hope for the future. And now they can tell their families that there is hope for the future. So we need to remember that it's this, this digital initiative, especially, it's people Connecting with other people through technology. There's nothing virtual about that. Chatbots are never going to bring hope to anyone. It's people praying for other people. It's people connecting with others. And, and if you're playing a part of this, may God bless you because you are helping to impact each individual person and many and many and many of them. So those are some of the thoughts that I had from the book. I will start our discussion today with my son, I have a deal with him. His birthday is coming up. Uh, he's 10 years old. James, you can get up. He's been listening here. This is James, everyone. And my deal with James is this. I, I bought him a phone. It's a brand new iPhone SE. His birthday is coming up, which is much more than I normally spend on a phone. But I have a deal with him. He is going to listen and read every book of this book club. He's 10 years old. I, can, I cannot imagine what God would do with a 10-year-old that is going through these 12, 13 books that we're going through. And James has read uh, Leaders Eat Last, and he has three observations that he had from the book. He has to produce a summary of these books, and I'm going to read that summary. And if he misses a week, he loses the phone. That's the deal. How about that for dopamine and endorphins? <laughs> There's nothing like a fully motivated child. Um, so James, what are your thoughts on the book? And then we can ask other people's thoughts. And if you want to take part, you can just make your comments here and we will um, bring you in as a panelist and 
or at least you can talk, I can give you a voice. Go ahead, son. Um, leaders must sacrifice their things for people and not sacrifice the people for to save your things. Excellent. And then another one was the leaders. A leader must break the rules for the people if needed. I'm sure <laughs> he found the one that talks about breaking rules. Trust James to, to, to find that. Okay, excellent. Next. Um, don't you don't need the best team, the best of the best team to do a great thing. You just need a good leader. That's very deep. Thank you, son. Good. I'm going to open the mic so you can listen to what everybody else is saying. Um, th this is a very deep one because it's easy for you to say, look, if I had a better team, I would be able to achieve this, that, and the other. Uh, no, you have the team you've got. And that's that. So pray, um, help them, and lead them. Because time and again, we find that good leaders can turn a team that is losing into champions. And nothing else changes except the leader. And if you're a leader, just about the only thing you can control is yourself. If that. So start there. That's where it starts. And uh, some people ask, but I'm not leading anybody. Well, that's, that's, that's not true. Or how can I lead others in terms of, of ascending? How can I lead my boss? How can I lead their boss? You're called to lead everybody, including your leaders. They need all the help they can get. But people get it when they get it and not a moment sooner. So help them understand what it is that you're trying to do. Because if they understand it, they're going to find all the resources you need. Your leader exists to give you resources to do your job. So if they understand what you're trying to achieve, they will give you more resources. If they don't understand what you're trying to achieve, your life will be hell. And that's, that describes much of my ministry. Um, because I failed to help my leaders understand what I was trying to do. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's have, we have some hands. Uh, if you want to talk, just raise your hand. There's a little thing. Uh, Jeannie. Uh, Ginny. Okay, Ginny, uh, go ahead. You need to unmute yourself, Ginny. The story I like the best was a story about the uh, submarine commander who was switched at the last minute to the team and the submarine that was the worst of the worst from the one that was the best and how his team uh, the recruitment improved and his team became commanders of their own ships several of them <clears throat> fascinating about how that switched because he was making orders and they were being followed even though the capacity to follow them was not present so then he changed the way he ran things. Fantastic story. Thank you. Um, James was, was talking to me about that as well. That was very impactful to him. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I see who else? Uh, Darren, did you want to say something? No. Uh, uh, Yita. Go ahead, Yita. Okay. Um, everybody hearing me fine? Yeah. Okay. So my, I have a very um, interesting situation in the church I go to, and it is that most young people are professionals and very um, numbers oriented and task oriented. And they have the, it's like they're addicted to uh, get another diploma, get another certificate, be the best, da, 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 da in a professional setting, but then they bring that to church. And sometimes um, there's a drive to work, but there's no love and there is no understanding and there is no, uh, the, the human aspect is just gone. So how can you make somebody or not make, but help somebody to understand that sometimes you kind of need to hit the brakes a bit 
and and interact more and love somebody and try to understand somebody, but also to make them aware of the the um, the addictive element to being such uh, numbers driven and diploma driven person. I mean, it's not bad to be professional and be the best at what you do, but sometimes people maybe they lack in some other areas of their life and they try to make up for it in being the overachieving professional. So how, how could you manage that situation? Yeah, excellent question. Um, I wanna open up to the panelists that are here. Any of you that uh, you can see yourself on the screen now, feel free to jump in. Uh, there are some people that are so conscientious and driven that if you drop them in the middle of a forest with only a machete, if you come back in a few months, you will see a house, you will see an entire infrastructure that they will build. Some people just love working. They love achieving things. They love doing things. Um, and, and they have their focus. Other times, they're just trying to avoid uh, practical stuff. I remember in one co-porting, uh, co-porting, if you're not familiar with it, is selling books to people that don't want to buy books with the money they don't have to buy books. That's co-porting, in essence. And I was co-porting one summer and this friend of mine, um, he just loved learning, right? So he started reading about sales and he would say, you know, tomorrow I'm going to spend the day and then tomorrow I'm going to go and I'm going to test this out. But he never actually went. He spent like three weeks studying. Um, and I realized he was studying because he was so scared of sales. He was so scared of knocking on doors and getting things done. So there are multiple reasons why people want to achieve different things. And uh, a lot of it comes back to fear. So that's, that's uh, one of the points. Anyone else from the panelists want to say something about that? Uh, Karen, go ahead, unmute yourself. Yeah, the drivenness is amazing. And if they can turn that drivenness into being focused on people, they will be absolutely unstoppable. If they can have an experience just once in knowing that they have made a long-term difference in somebody's life, as opposed to just achieved numbers, then they will be going after relationships as often as they possibly can. And that will become their new number, is how many people can I make a difference in their lives? I, I organized and took many young people on mission trips multiple times. And the thing that they would take, you know, sometimes we'd be staying in the most abject conditions, sleeping in hammocks on hard cement floors. And, you know, it was not comfortable as per se, you know, no cell phone signal, forget that man. And um, they would come away saying that the difference between where they came from, regardless of where that was from, because they were not all Americans, but where they came from and where they were serving is that their impression was that stuff at home was, your success was measured by influence and money so far as business is concerned. And here they felt like wherever the here was, that what was most important was friends and family. They said, have you noticed that they look at you in the eye when they talk to you? Do you notice that when you walk in the church, everybody wants you to sit with them? Even if you're not the speaker, you're not the important person, you're just the visitor. That brings true serotonin and true meaning to life, Excellent. is being able to connect and make a difference. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay, who's next to hear with their hand? Um, Daisy. Go ahead, Daisy Palatel. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning from the Philippines. Um, you know what? This is a very humbling um, experience for me because I've been working in, uh, yes, in a university, Catholic university for the past 14 years. And I quit last, last year and I tried to apply in the general conference only to become a digital missionary. Um, the leadership, the management, yeah, I've been trained. But you know what? The humility, the, 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 the new learnings that I am realizing now is so enormous that I can't help but thank God that I'm working with our church. And uh, with your uh, book club, Pastor Sam, I can see myself growing, not only in my relationship with others, but also growing in my maturity towards my ministry to church, to the church. Excellent. Now my, 
Daisy, Daisy, you lead a team. You lead one of our teams there, don't you? Yes, Pastor Sam, the Facebook group. Facebook group. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, my, I don't know if this is a question or it's like um, sometimes, I don't know if, if uh, you've experienced this, but sometimes being passive, like expectations, right? We sometimes ex expect something from somebody, whether it's from our leaders or from our brethren. And uh, what I've learned is that sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's not so good. Because when we expect something from somebody, most of the time we get uh, disappointed, right? And at the end of the day, I get to realize, well, I'm serving my God. And I know our God sees our hearts and sees our purpose. And so before I end my day, I just realized, okay, tomorrow will be another day. I'll just do what I have to do. I'll do my best. I'll try to share some things to my teams and my and the team Philippines as 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 a, as a uh, something that hopefully inspires them because you know what when I worked with this Catholic university in the Philippines for fourteen years, I was given the opportunity to administer to become manager. But you know. I started from zero when I worked in this ministry. It's really different. You know, you are working with God-driven people. You are working to serve the Lord. You are connecting with people at Facebook. You can just imagine the blessing that I have. And with this, I just hope and pray that um, God will use us all to this ministry. Excellent. Thank you very much, Daisy. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, any other thoughts on, on this? Uh, we have Gaurav is next, unless somebody wants to say something about this. No, I don't see any hands. Okay. Uh, Gaurav, go ahead. Hi, good morning from Dubai. Um, thanks for sharing. I was listening to the uh, review of uh, Simon Sinek on, on YouTube. And uh, of course, he is not a creationist. He is evolutionist. And uh, he referred to human race as, as human animal. And uh, even in your presentation, as you mentioned, lions and other animals do have same chemical um, uh, going on in their brains. So uh, how do we um, uh, understand the creation view out of this understanding of chemicals uh, in our brains? How much different we as humans are still compared to animals like lions and others? And then, uh, yeah, how do we produce or focus on producing the right chemicals in our brains? That, that's a, a great question. Look, Simon makes use of many times, he says, nature, what nature did as if nature is a person. It's, very diff it's actually very difficult to be a true evolutionist. You need to, at some point, have some idea of design. The way that nature did this was for that. Well, in an evolutionary perspective, nature does not have an opinion or a voice. So the, the, the thing we're, we're really handling and dealing with here is, is really God creating a set of hormones in a way that our body works that guides our our thinking. So your question on how different is it to animals and humans, how, um, the main difference is that we get to choose whether we're going to be a victim of our instincts or, either, or whether we're going to make a difference in how we, we process this. So let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When you experience, um, when you react during the day as you are living your life, when you react in a certain way, your brain will interpret those experiences and it will produce a certain hormone. So I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, up until a few years ago, I would be driving and Amy, my wife, would be, you know, next to me. And let's say, uh, and this happened, you know, a couple of times a year, there will be a car coming or there, the traffic lights it just turned uh, amber or yellow. And my reaction time wasn't fast enough. And just before I pressed the brake, Amy would come in and, and, and immediately say, be careful. 
And every husband has been through this, right? This, this moment where you react. And the natural reaction of a man is to have uh, the reaction of, do you want to drive? Because I'm driving. I, I, I saw it. Thank you. That's the normal reaction is to feel, is to respond in such a way. Because of the nervousness of the situation and what have you, you respond in an aggressive way. When you respond in an aggressive way, what happens is your brain thinks, wow, for him to respond like that, he must have been attacked. Let's give him some cortisol so that he can react appropriately to the threat. There are some people that spend all day producing cortisol unnecessarily right? They don't mean to. It's just that they're always defensive. You know, some people are always defensive. You, you say something to them and they're like immediately aggressive and defensive. When you are defensive in your answers, your brain interprets this as you being attacked. Again, somebody's attacking him. I better give him some cortisol. Let's go. And there are some people that are more aggressive than others. And you can spend your whole day flooded in cortisol unnecessarily. Now let's review that again. If I, and, and, uh, one of the books we have in this um, in this book club uh, is "Take It to the Next Level." So it's a uh, the the audio book is called "Take It to the Next Level." The actual book is called "What Got You Here Won't Get You There," and it's going through 21 things that you are doing which will stop you from moving forward in your leadership. And one of those things he gives the example. And three four years ago, when I read the example of of him and his wife, I thought I do the same thing. So I decided to stop doing it. And I decided that when Amy would do that again, I wasn't going to react in the same way. In fact, I was going to turn and say thank you because that's what she's trying to do. She's trying to save you from a car crash. She's trying to help you. There is no point reacting in a negative way. It's a help that you are that you are being given and you re- not only do you reject the, the help, you humiliate the helper. And and that doesn't help anybody. So in in this situation, I it happened again, same thing. Traffic light or car, I don't remember. But I I turned to her, and you know when you the car stops like this, and I turned to her and said, "Baby, thank you. That was that was great. Thank you for telling me." I had seen the car, and inside, I did not want to say thank you. But guess what? Because I said thank you, my brain interpreted it as saying, "My goodness, that's someone else trying to help this guy." He says, thank you all day. People are falling over themselves to help him. He must be high in the status hierarchy here. Let's give him a lot of serotonin. And when I started saying thank you all day long, my life completely changed. And I I need to tell you that it changed in ways that you cannot imagine. Uh, Biologically changed. I will... I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Since I was a since I was a child, since I was about three or four years old, I started developing some psoriasis behind my ear and in my scalp, and it was very humiliating as a child. And I, you know, going to school and having psoriasis, and I always had it um, as a teenager, even as an adult. And my mom needed to put some oil and remove the psoriasis. It was awful. And I always had it. As an adult, I had to think when I was going to get my hair cut because a couple of days before I had to take the psoriasis off, wait for it to heal, put some cream, and then get my hair cut. And that was the process. And this got worse and worse um, in ministry. And I thought, you know, there's nothing I can do. I went to every doctor. I did every test and nothing happened. When I decided to spend the day saying thank you, listen to what I'm saying. It's too powerful to miss. From the moment within six months of me changing my perception and spending the day saying thank you and appreciating people for what they do, I haven't had any of this for the last two and a half, three years. What I'm trying to tell you is that your body will react in ways you cannot imagine. I've never been happier in my life. And the reason is not my environment. That helps too, of course. But the real reason is that I decided I was going to spend my day producing serotonin as much as possible. And when you honor someone else, when you find the time to say something that is truthful and that it's insightful and that it honors someone else in detail, I promise you the amount of serotonin you will produce will bring you such health and such happiness. You've never experienced that before. It's, it's, at least in my experience, it's amazing. And that decision is yours. Animals don't get to decide this. Animals just act on instinct. 
uh, but you get to decide how you react to the world and your brain will follow suit. So that's some meditation about that uh, itself. Let's go to Rosie or yeah, let's go to Rosie. Rosie here, allowed to talk. Go ahead. Rosie, unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. My thought about this is that especially with, the, with that someone who talked about the young people in the church, um, I believe that it is really very important that as a team, there must be an objective or goal before the team can move, can move on and what the team would really want to achieve for it must be time frame for a certain period of time. And then each person must be motivated to personally come up with his own objective, which is aligned to the objective of the group. And everyone can, can work together. And if each person has his own personal objective and be able to discuss it with the team and with the leader, then each oh, one would be able to know more about that person, a better knowledge of how that person thinks, what are his ideas, and this kind of opportunity of discussing would, would be able to give each one the chance to honor or to appreciate the ideas or the opinions of each person. So from there, teamwork would start to develop, and then there would be personal connection um, between the group, between each individual, because it's really very difficult to, to lead um, a group if one has difficulty of leading his own self, because we cannot give what we do not. Excellent. Fantastic comments. Well done. That's, that's spot on. Understand where you're going. Um, you can get there, but you need to know where you're going. So... Excellent point. How can you appreciate somebody achieving an objective if you have no idea what that objective was? Uh, well done. Uh, Scott, you're next. Yeah, I just, I mean, I mentioned it in the comments, but I think this, this uh, one of the great challenges that we have as a church, and it's something that's really uh, counterproductive, is a, a, a fear to fail. You know, as a church, we, we, we strive uh, to do what is right so much that we are afraid of failure. And, and for anybody to be uh, to achieve anything great, you have to embrace failure. You have to be willing to fail. And as a leader, I think we need to uh, be willing to to encourage people to fail, to to you know choose people. I mean, look at look at look at the Bible. The, the story after story after story is us as Christians with a Christian worldview. The Bible is full of people who failed, absolutely full of it. I mean, every single man who became a great man of God failed time and time and time again. And I think for us to truly succeed in in anything that we do, we need to embrace failure and be willing to fail. Excellent thoughts. Absolutely. And fail big and fail fast and, and recover and learn and move forward. Alyssa, I saw your hashtag there, fail big. Uh, yes, this is definitely in the digital world, especially. Uh, you need to launch multiple things very quickly and reenter and iterate them. This is particularly difficult in older and larger organizations. The, the older the organization, the more embedded the traditions and the more difficult it is to move forward. And the larger the organization, the more permissions you need to ask. Large corporations are absolutely obsessed with permissions. And the key question that everyone has when somebody says, I managed to do this, that, or the other, the key question is, who gave you permission to do that? that that's what people are obsessed about. Who gave you permission to try this? Who gave you permission to do that and the other? And it takes a while for you to, to learn that the hoops and the check boxes are there to protect and it takes a longer while for you to win the trust of leadership to allow you to have bigger and bigger sandboxes because that's what you're doing. You are winning the trust on little things. Then you get a bigger sandbox. Now you can play with marbles. Then you get a slightly bigger sandbox and a slightly bigger sandbox. And a lot of young people are disappointed by that process. Don't be disappointed by that process. The things that really matter in life are not achieved in six months. They are achieved in, in, in 30 years. And a lot of millennials, especially young people, you know, eight months after they are in an organization, they begin to say, I'm not quite sure I'm making a difference here. Come on. You've been there for eight months. What, you don't even understand the culture. What difference are you going to make? You know, I'm, I'm, 
as you can tell, I've had those conversations before. Shut up, sit down, do your best, hone your craft. And the better you are at it and the more humble you are, the more influence you're going to have, the bigger the sandbox you're going to have. Do not expect the stars uh, to happen within a few, you know, to see stars within a few, a few days of being in an organization. It takes years and years. And as you look around the people in this screen, as I'm talking about this, you know, I look at them and I see where their ministry was and where it is. And I can only imagine where it's going because they've taken the time to do their best slowly. They've respected whatever system is there. No one wants to be inefficient, not even large organizations. Um, so they're willing and they're open to new people that are going to make a difference in making everything easier and better. You just need to be patient. And I'll, I'll give you another testimony. When I was a pastor in England for 11 years, um, I used to think to myself and pray in anger to God, God, why do you put people in charge who have absolutely no idea that we are in the 21st century? Lord, bring them through. Find a way because why do you put those people in charge? They have no idea how to get this mission done. And I blamed them. And then within a few months of being in the general conference, I came to, to a, a great guy who does branding for Nike and Sony and all of these big corporations. And I told him my frustration that, you know, I said, remember the project, the branding project I mentioned before, I said, look, I'm trying to rebuild the brand of the Adventist church and my leaders just don't get it. And then he just smiled and said, I've been paid a lot of money by this large corporation. For the last three years, I've been trying to help their administration to understand that their brand is not their logo. They still don't get it. And Sam, people get it when they get it and not a moment sooner. That sentence absolutely changed my life because when he said this, suddenly it wasn't the responsibility of the leader to know, it was mine. Now I am in control of that. And I love things that I'm in control of because I can do something about it. So then I decided, okay, let's have a roadmap here. I had Elder Wilson on an image. I had uh, Billy Biaggi, Vice President for Communication on an image. I had Williams on another. And I decided to paths of how I'm going to help each of my leaders understand technology and digital mission and all of this. And I had specific events I had to take them to. Guys, I took Pastor Biaggi to Web Summit the largest tech event in the world, 80,000 people go there. And Pastor Biagi, who I don't know, is in his 60s. We went from booth to booth. We went from talk to talk and we would listen to the expert and I said, see, Pastor, that's exactly what we need to do. Do you see why? And he goes, yes, I see. We need to do this to reach 7.8 billion people. And, and that's Pastor Biagi. When he got it, when he understood it, well, guess what? He was driving the game. Now, suddenly, I'm trying to catch up to send them stuff so that he can present it to administration and we can move in different directions. Um, Ray is here on the call. I can see his, his face here as a panelist. I came to Ray a long time ago and said, hey, hey Ray, um, <laughs> is, is our under treasure. So, uh, Elder Ray Wallen. <laughs> we need to find a better way to to have contracts with people from around the world. The Adventist church is rich in amazing professionals and we are not built for that. The general conference is just not, let's find a better tool. And that's how we discovered Upwork. And it took months and months and, and Ray, without you, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, simply because it takes a long time in a corporation to get things done. Have the patience, do your best, show results. And, and guess what? You will have a slightly bigger sandbox every year. And if you have the patience, you're going to do amazing things for God. This is God's church, not yours. It's not your church. If it was yours, you would run it differently, but it's not yours. It's, it belongs to Jesus. It's his bride. And also in this, I'm, I'm beginning to preach now, but be very careful how you talk about the bride. Uh, it's his bride. Have great respect for his bride. Be very careful how you talk about his bride. And when other people come to you and they want to say things against, against the church or against another member of your team, don't entertain it. Just don't do it. Um, I, I've, I've often had this. People come to me and says, you know, Sam, we really need to talk about that person. 
And then they proceed to describe a problem in that person. Um, let me give you a reaction that is very helpful. You just look at the person and say, hey, how are we going to help them? Clearly, they have a problem. How is it that we're going to help? Let's, have, let's build a strategy for helping them. And suddenly, the, the script changes immediately. And suddenly, you don't, you don't, you're, you're saying it in a constructive way. And by the time it's finished, you have a strategy of how you're tangibly going to help them understand something that so far they haven't. And this way, you build teams that feel safe. Um, otherwise, when people don't feel safe, the mess is, is not worth even imagining. Uh, okay, I have a few more hands here. Let's try and go through. Uh, we'll finish in 20 minutes. So, uh, Lizbeth. Go ahead. Lizbeth. Unmute. Lizbeth, can you unmute yourself? Uh, nope. Lizbeth, we can see you, but we can't hear you. So we wait until you come back. Uh, Lizbeth is a great video editor from Mexico. Uh, Whitney, Whitney, let's try, let's try you. Whitney. Uh, good evening to everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Whitney from Santo Domingo. Uh, Dominican Republic, and I'm really happy for this uh, topic tonight about the leadership. And I understand that the real leadership um, we can um, wound after or we can follow is uh, the leadership um, from Jesus. Jesus is the real leader. Um, we can see during all his life, how Jesus lived um, different person, different characteristic, and different culture, we can say. But especially in the book of John, and chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gave it his life for the sheep. That's mean when you want to be a good leader, you're supposed to be a good shepherd. For sure, you are a shepherd because you have other people um, keep watch over you. That's mean you have to lead them um, through the white path. And I can say that Jesus give us already give us the way we're supposed to lead people. Um, like Pastor Sam just said, uh, this church is the bride. Jesus is really care about the church. That's been when you are uh, placing yourself on, on the church like a leader, you're supposed to care about your way, about the, 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 the actions, um, all the things you're going to do because you have order keep watching over you. And since you miss your path, for sure, you're going to bring others on the, on, we can say, on the wrong, wrong path or wrong place. And I, I want to invite all digital missionaries, um, I know they all are leaders, to follow Jesus. Jesus is the uh, right leader we have, we must to follow, the way to have um, great, um, we can say great um, 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 goals and reach people all over the world because now it's the time to spread the gospel all over the world. But we need leaders, leaders like Jesus, Leader, leaders what, um, who wants to um, um, watch over Jesus and keep um, say or uh, flow the gospel like Jesus did. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Whitney. That was, that was very insightful. That's absolutely right. Uh, Shekinah Pearl, you're next. Okay, so um, it's morning here in the Philippines, and so good morning. Actually, I am uh, I am just new to the faith. I've been an Adventist before, but um, 
since uh, no, since the beginning, but I just had my tr transition during um, PYC 2020. So basically, I don't have any ideas uh, with media ministry, but we are starting a lot of it this past few months, uh, this past few weeks, and because it is the platform that the Lord has given to me. And what I really um, appreciate and what I really teach to my um to my team and to my um, team members is that if we really would want to um, for our ministry to be more effective, we really need to follow the blueprint that Jesus Christ gave us. For example, what I really appreciated with Jesus' um, ministry while um, while he was still here on earth was he is not the one who is who is asking people to adjust to him rather he is the one who is reaching out to them he is the one going from houses to houses and he is the one who is really doing these things and um it's like and i have experienced it at the, at the same time in my personal um uh walk with the lord so it's like when i was um when i am when we are starting to strategize with the team about the um we are still working on with the fb fb page because it's uh the basic platform that we can use since we are still um newbies and we don't really have a lot of um trained people um it's like we need to learn who who is the market and then after that we meet we must cater to their needs and we must present jesus in all the ways because it's like jesus um like adjusted to their uh no to their position yet he did not adjusted his principles so it's like that is one of the things that i really uh, I really appreciate in the ministry of yes. in the ministry. And one more thing is, when we were starting, actually I started tapping a lot of people who are uh, whom I know that have has a knowledge in Photoshop and things like that, video editing. But most of them are saying that that is not practical. The things that you are saying are not practical. It won't work. It won't work. But then it was so hard. It's like it's so hard to let go. But then my parents would, my mother most especially would say, would tell me that anak maybe. Uh, that person is not really for the ministry. Maybe that is not the one that God wants to be part of your team. So it's like we let go of it. And then what happened is uh, people just, <laughs> it's like when we started to pray, particularly my family about this ministry, so it's like God has sent a lot of people who are not really that equipped, but are willing to learn and to be equipped for the That's ministry. Right. And I think, and I think um, commitment is much more, uh, willingness and commitment is much more important than, um, than, uh, than your abilities, initial abilities. The ab yeah. Yes, the skills because the skills can be learned, but your willingness right. is something that cannot be forced out of a person. So right. that is what I really appreciated uh, during this um, this conference as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Somebody came to Spurgeon once after he preached the sermon and pointed out all of his grammatical mistakes in his sermon. And Spurgeon looked at the woman, and these guys were vicious. So he looked at her and said, well, I'm using the little English I have to proclaim Jesus. What are you doing with yours? And, and that kind of hit home to the woman. We don't know what happened with the woman, but we know about Sturgeon. So, uh, Fernand Globen, you're next. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, Pastor Sam. I said to myself, I'm not going to be talking. Oh, Ben. Talk yes, your name is Fernand. That's right. Yeah, that's my real name. But you said something that really connected to me today. Um, there's something I'm going to share to you and to the entire group. It's um, It's been years and months that I haven't been active with the church, and there were plenty of encounters where I almost left the church. Only my music placed me there, hanging by a thread. Um, there's a one funny experience. I don't know who's in charge with the email of Adventist.org. Months ago, I actually sent an email there suggesting that, hey, um, hello, Adventist.org. I would love 
to help you out. I was offering like SEO services. Months before that, I was I tried to offer uh, my SEO skills to the local churches and to even to the publishing house here. I was met with a lot of ridicule and with a lot of rejections. Nobody said yes. Okay. And prior to that life experience, I already have encounters with leaders that really something in my mind told me I'm going to be leaving church. So instead of leaving church, I focus on my music and I, I did music ministry outside of the church. We are currently teaching. I'm working with the local government, teaching street kids to play in an orchestra and we bring them in places internationally. Going back to the church, to be perfectly honest with you, when you said um, something like that, that why, God, why are you putting people who doesn't know how the, <laughs> the technology works? Okay. So I don't know who's in charge of your email, but if you, 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 you check your email from months ago, I sent one and I got no reply. Months later forward, here I am. <laughs> here you are. And, and for those that don't know, um, BEM is his nickname. Uh, Fernan is the leader of our SEO team. Uh, in the Philippines. So now God is, be careful when you pray saying, God, I offer you my best and I offer you, you know, my, my skills because God takes that stuff very seriously. And if you're <laughs> serious about it, he will find a way for you to use it. Ma'am, thank you very much. Let's go to New Zealand, Leandro. Hello, Sam. Hello, everybody. It's good afternoon for me. Good evening for you. Uh, anyway, my question, well, my question is, I work for an organization that is addicted to cortisol. Uh, and it's kind of, <laughs> and it, it, it's survival mode all the time. It is, it is. So that, that book made so, ma so much sense. I mean, it was exactly what we were going through. But anyway, um, especially when some, something happens or you have a fact, you have an object or something and then you look at it and you say okay that's good maybe you could change one thing here or there but then uh it's good it's good news but someone else would look at it and, and say this is horrible life's horrible uh i hate it and and, and that's the culture implemented there uh, my question is how do you change someone else's way to view the world because sometimes it's the way you're looking at it and that's the impression i have uh, it, for example, the, the story that you told with your wife, if your wife was, if you told your wife, uh, you're going to hit the car, there's a car over there, and she would get back to you and say, don't tell me what to do or don't tell me how to drive or something. How could you change her way to see the world, you know? Um, that's my question. If, if you find out the answer, write a book. We will all buy it. We would sell it to <laughs> others and give it away. Uh, especially to some of our leaders. Um, guys, any, any of the panelists here, any wisdom you could bring, Leandro? Alyssa, please. So this isn't necessarily going to change the leader. But when you have a change in mindset yourself, and you can start instilling that mindset shift within the culture of your start, start with the person next to you, and then it starts kind of slowly creeping out amongst it, it actually will start to be felt even by your leadership. They will start noticing these differences. And the more, going back to like what we kind of talked about last week, the more we affirm them, when we spot the things they're doing right and we affirm those things, I think that this is not promising any, any major shift, but I think that the shift can start with you. And then if you can bring other people on that journey with you, it just becomes a bigger, more impactful thing that hopefully, hopefully can also create that shift. Excellent. There is a, a very important part of this, which is when you need to say things to somebody, but you don't do it, it will inevitably lead to resentment. Resentment is when you have things to tell, say to somebody which you haven't. And resentment is going to kill you. Or at least if the level of resentment and cortisol increase in an organization, that organization will die. So um, 
sometimes you need to have difficult conversations and and express that to people you know privately uh, challenge up support down what does that mean if you need to challenge somebody challenge your leaders that's that's the point um, have that conversation individually and say i i I need to understand what you need from me, what you would like me to achieve, because I'm here to deliver that. And it's not clear. And it's not clear because I'm going to tell you three stories and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. And then you tell this story, that story, that story. Clearly, we have, we have some problem here. Last thing I'll say about that that I've observed is when people have cortisol running through their system, they cannot help but produce cortisol in other people. It's inevitable. So it's possible that your, your leader's leader is going through, is, is also putting that pressure on them, and they're just passing that on to you. Uh, if you find yourself being the one receiving it, just please make sure you don't pass it on to your team. It stops with you because you have the, the opportunity to stop it. Um, so those are, are some thoughts on this on this subject um yeah it's it's very complicated <laughs> justin yeah sam i th i think uh if i i just i'm really excited about this topic and i appreciate your digestion of this if i can take what Alyssa said and just kind of maybe put my my digest my digestion on top of it is that after reading that sounds really gross uh the, the, take the the four uh the, the hormones and we've been talking about kind of this horizontal relationships and, 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 and leadership and organizations and whatnot. But what, what's come to my mind is that a lot of us, and especially as I, I'm part of young adult ministry and in Sabbath school, and when we look at how young adults interact with God, we, act, we, we, we interact with God on a dopamine level as well. Mm. That when we encounter scripture on a dopamine level, just as a checkbox that we, we mark off, or a chapter we just read, or something we just go through because we have to. And it seems like, uh, oh no, everything we're saying here, I totally agree with, but we need to have that serotonin, that oxytocin experience, even endorphin experience with God first, oh, man. Uh, regardless of whatever time of the day it is. Preach and it. That, that first bond really calibrates us for every relationship throughout the day, whether it's above or lower or whatnot. And that, that causes about organizational change in an in a high cortisol area or a high dopamine area or whatnot. But it's we ourselves need to be calibrated with that hormonal, I don't know what the right term is, but that this is what's coming to my mind, that sometimes I got a lot of stuff to do, so I just want God to bless me. So let me just get my devotions out of the way, but we can't because that's precisely the reason of why we get into the ruts that we do. Anyway, that's just, just to calibrate, you know, just to add to my, whatever Alyssa said, said, but connecting it back to, to God, which I know she's intending, but... Excellent. Oh. Imagine a, a worship session, a, a Thanksgiving worship session where you are constantly thanking God for everything that he's given you. In, in your mind, your, your brain begins to process that the ruler and, and king of the universe is interested in you and is providing for you and is creating an environment for you and is protecting you and wants what is best for you suddenly you don't get any higher status than that in the in in the universe um and you just i, I need a pulpit because the the only um social class in in the new earth would be a would be a uh, would be kings and queens we will all be kings and queens we're called to be kings and queens. That's why we have crowns. And so this is a profound view of oneself that God looks at you and says, to me, you are a king. So act like it. It's a, it's a calling forth of what you have best. And if that doesn't produce serotonin in you, I really don't know what would. <laughs> um, <laughs> because nothing here would do that more than that. Hello. Pastor? Yes, Pearl. Can I add something as well? I think um, this I know, this topic was actually discussed in uh, PYC 2020, The Gathering, by Pastor Jason Sliger. Actually, I really have, actually, I applied it into our family. Just a quick background. Um, 
our family is like a really wounded one because uh, uh, we have a uh, very different and um, broken, we are not a broken family, but our relationship is not that good with each other. But then <clears throat> after I, I, I went to this um, conference, what one thing that I've uh, that was really instilled to my mind is that uh, that uh, sermon that says that um, Jesus sent sends us as lambs among wolves. Be wise as serpent, but be hum- harmless as doves. Why? It's like if you will look at it, the lamb will die among the wolves, right? If you send the lamb among the wolves, he will die. But Dangerous. it's mm-hmm. it's it's very interesting because when when we in a in a um in a spiritual sense we can see that um we can see that uh when your spirit is like a lamb when they see the spirit of Jesus Christ in you that will change them into something you cannot imagine and i have seen that in my family basically my brother hates me i hate my father <laughs> i'm not in good terms with my mother and this, this things but when jesus christ started changing me and i started forgiving them showing them this love that jesus christ gave me our family drastically changed within three weeks i'm telling you it's it's magic it's not magical it's a miracle it's the- and i think that is something that we should always look at it, it's like the pastor you have said now you cannot do something about others it's their part but you can do something about yours and that and one thing that is really amazing is that when you when god changes you you can be a factor for change for others as well that's right thank you very much for that uh guys you have a um a survey a poll right in front of you 30 of you have responded already 58 still need to respond just go ahead and click 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 um and then send it through so we have an idea of what is uh how you are reacting to this uh we've reached our 90 minutes and we want to thank you so much for uh for joining us and for being part of this uh, we'll stay on for a, a couple of minutes. If you have a few comments or thoughts after the prayer, that's fine. Uh, but next week, we will be back and we'll have a book next week. It's called uh, Story Brand. So how to build a story brand. We're going to talk about the journey of the hero. And it's going to be an absolutely amazing experience. This is a phenomenal book that you should definitely read. Invest the time. It's worth it. Uh, Kyle Morrison, who is here on the call, that's Kyle Morrison. He is a story brand guide. He'll be here with us next week, helping us uh, to talk about this. And But for now, let's have a word of prayer and let's end tonight's book club. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come and to talk and to experience uh, our our story in the context of your story. Lord, thank you for the calling of leadership We pray that we will be the kind of leaders that will honor what Jesus taught us and what he, who he was as a leader. Father, bless us as we lead our teams. May all the work that we produce be to your honor and glory and to help bring people to a knowledge of salvation and a knowledge, of course, of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.